on metal compiler that we call the Opascator, and that's the object we would like to design. So there are lots of different notions of security for a program of uh, circuit of fascination. And we talk about the weakest one called indistinguishability of fascator, or I.O. for short in the rest of the talk. And it's the weakest security <coughs> notion because it really only hides one bit of information, which is which of the following two equivalent circuits, C1 or C2, is being a fascinated. And here by equivalence, we mean that the two circuits need to have the same size, and more importantly, they need to have identical truth table. So in particular, they cannot be separated by just evaluating some input and obtaining the output. If they satisfy these two, the equivalence notion, then we would like the output of the fast gator, which we call the fast gator circuit, to have a distribution that are computationally indistinguishable. And uh, since the proposal of this notion, I.O., in 2001, it has been a long-standing goal in cryptography to actually achieve this notion. And surprisingly, for a long time, uh, there was no progress at all. Until 2013, that Garg et al. introduced the first candidate I.O. construction, and as you can see today, we really have more than a dozen constructions. However, all those constructions share the common denominator that they are based on this same framework of algebraic structure, which we call graded encodings. And so far, there have been several candidate graded encodings proposed, but unfortunately, all, all of them were shown vulnerable to different kinds of attacks. And furthermore, uh, cryptanalysis has advanced today that we can even carry over some of those attacks to direct... Uh, now we even have direct attack on I.O. constructions when they're instantiated with some specific <laughs> graded encoding schemes. So the situation is really we're balancing at the border of security and insecurity. A lot of I.O. constructions are today still not known to be directly broken. However, we would also like to base the security of I.O. on a more solid foundation. So the question we ask towards that goal is what objects and assumptions can actually imply I.O.? And so far, we see the common denominator is jazz. However, this tool, as we will see shortly, is quite heavy in the sense it has lots of properties, functionality, security guarantees. And it's a heavy object. It has, we have not been very successful in lifting it up. But no matter how heavy it is, as a wise man says, if you give me a point and a lever, we will be able to lift the earth, right? So. The idea is, can we actually lift up this heavy jazz <laughs> by using some light jazz in particular? And it turns out that we can do so if you have the help of this seemingly irrelevant object, which is simple and easier to understand, and we all love it, called the PRG. And in particular, those ones that have a certain locality. And of course, when we use a lever, we have to pay some effort, right? It's not for free. And the effort that we're going to pay here is that we will beef up the security reduction, that we'll do way more in the security reduction so that we can have construction that can be based on simpler objects. <coughs> so what exactly is different between heavy versus light? One significant metric of difference is the degree of the graded encoding. And we say uh, graded encoding has degree L if it supports evaluation of degree L polynomials over encoded ring elements and allow you to test whether the output of the polynomial is zero or not. Okay. And in this light, high versus light means high degree versus low degree. And as you can imagine, that low degree Yes, it's first of all simpler and uh, provides much weaker uh, functionality. 
And with respect to the noisy instantiations we have today, they tend to be more secure because you can afford to use smaller noise. And with respect to the algebraic instantiation that we don't have today, it is potentially easier to build low degree jazz as opposed to full version high degree jazz. And furthermore, I would like to stress that it's just an interesting and very basic question to try to understand what are the power of those low degree jets. Okay, what is the power of low degree ones? And additionally, our low degree jets will also have weaker functionality and security guarantees than the heavy ones that I will talk about very soon. Okay. So here is the very brief history of I.O. construction through the lens of the degree. The first generation I.O. <laughs> which is blank, great. <laughs> the first generation, because there's always a lag between my view and the, okay. All right, much better. The first generation constructions all depend on just the support polynomial degree polynomials evaluation. And the security is usually analyzed in the so-called ideal model or based on over assumption, with only one exception that formulated a simpler assumption called multilinear subgroup elimination. And in 2016, there came on two works that showed that actually to build I.O. it suffices to have constant degree graded encodings. And the latter work even showed that we can base security <coughs> on a DDH-like assumption called a joint SXDH. Of course, as we saw before, this is not for free. We have to throw in at the other end of the lever an object called locality, constant locality pseudo-random generator. And the two very recent works managed to further isolate out what is the concrete low degree that we need all the way down to five. And part of the result I'm talking about today actually also to manage to use only the classical multilinear map versus as opposed to graded encoding and show security based on exactly the DDH assumption. And here correspondingly, we need to rely on a locality five PRG. And at this point, we hit a wall. Because the locality for PRG with polynomial stretch do not exist. And in another very, very recent fresh out of the bakery result with Stefano, that we managed to circumvent this lower bound and get the degree down to three by relying on a more relaxed notion of locality called the blockwise locality. And at this point, you probably will be wondering, indeed, there is another wall that we hit, which is blockwise locality two PRG do not exist. And as such, we're standing right now one degree away from bilinear map that we do have secure instantiation. Okay. So in this talk, I will, I will try to present to you both the degree three and the degree five paper uh, all together, and I'll just refer to them as this work. So first thing to start, let me tell you more precisely what the results are. So multilinear maps, as proposed by um, two works, as a direct generalization of bilinear map to higher degree, will allow us to encode the ring elements in some groups by just raising this element to the exponent. Okay? And we're going to denote these group elements using this bra bracket not notation where the index of this group is written at the lower right corner. Okay? And what can we do with this encoding? Because they're in groups, clearly addition is for free. Homomorphic addition is for free. And we can also zero test in the sense that give me a group element, I can test whether the encoded ring element is zero or not by comparing it with the identity element. And the magic of multi-degree or multi-linear map really lies in what we call the pairing operation. And it allows us to essentially do homomorphic multiplication that we can take group elements in different so-called source groups and pair them all together to produce an encoding of the product in a so-called target group. And the degree of the multilinear map is exactly how many elements you can pair together. 
and when the degree equals to 2, that's the famous bilinear map. Okay. So, as I said that multilinear map is different from graded encoding. Graded encoding is a stronger generalization of it. Well, multilinear map only allow you to pair a set of group elements in one shot and move to a target group that cannot be operated upon further. Graded encoding allows us to do kind of a graded multiplication. Now, you can actually do multiplication just between different group elements and get another group element that can be further paired with other elements. And this, in particular, allows you to evaluate a wider class of circuits that have layers of addition and multiplication. Furthermore, uh, only at the highest level. Yeah. And furthermore, in graded encoding, there is this notion called the parable labels, in the sense that only two encodings that are kind of encoded in groups or labels that are suitable, compatible with each other, can be paired together. And what this allows you to do is essentially that you can, through engineering what labels different elements are encoded under, you can control what are the set of polynomials that just cannot be evaluated. Therefore, it really provides more power supporting both functionality and security. And nevertheless, this is not what we're going to use. What we are going to st stuck with today is multilinear maps. Okay. In terms of the assumption, I said we rely on the DDH-like assumption called the SXDH. And what it is, is basically DDH should hold in each of the source group. In particular, for any, any source group you choose, the encoding of a DDH table, AB, AB, should be indistinguishable to encoding of all random and independent elements. And this indistinguishability should hold even when you're given with the generator in each group, which are essentially encodings of one. And this is the SXDH assumption that we'll use. Okay? So actually, in your thing, do you allow zero tests in each of the groups? Uh, or um, for functionality, you only need it at the end. For security, we'll handle even if you can do zero testing at every level. So, the main theorem that we achieve is there is a construction of I.O. from degree D linear multilinear map assuming sub-exponential SXDH assumption on the multilinear map and sub-exponentially secure locality D PRG and the sub-exponential LWE. And you can freely substitute the locality DPRG with a PRG that has blockwise locality. <laughs> and since everything has sub-exponential security, I'm just going to ignore this issue in the rest of the talk. Okay. So what are those blockwise local PRGs? Well, local PRG we're all very familiar with. It is a PRG that has polynomial stretch, and the locality is the maximum number of input bits where each output bit depends on. And there has been many studies trying to investigate what is the lowest locality that one can have still admitting a PRG. And so far, we have a candidate for locality equals to 5, and we also know that the locality smaller than 5 is impossible. So we have a fairly good understanding about local PRGs. The more relaxed notion of locality that we propose in this work is called blockwise locality. Here, instead of thinking about the seed as a bit string, we think about it as a bit matrix. And the block locality is the maximum number of input columns, or also called input blocks, that each output bit can depend on. Okay. As you can observe that if each block has a size b capped at log lambda, lambda is the security parameter, then the actual locality of this uh, PRG is the block locality times b. So actual locality could be much higher than the block locality. However, it is not the same 
as an arbitrary locality BL times B PRG because it has this special structure of being local with respect to the input blocks. So in this work, we started some preliminary study on the existence or the security. Yeah. Sanity check. Uh, what other constraints? Yeah. Why can't you put all the seed in one block? Is basically what I'm asking. In one block. Because of logarithmic. Ah, uh, because then we don't know how to use it. So what other constraints do you have? The constraint is that each of the block size is at most the log lambda. Okay. Yeah. It could be order log lambda, but not beyond. Okay. So we started some preliminary study on blockwise local PRG. And the most natural candidate that you can think of is just use Goldberg's local functions and replace each input bit with an input block. As simple as that. And such PRGs are parameterized with a bipartite graph with degree BL that indicates the input-output dependency graph and a vector of predicates where the ith one is the predicate used for evaluating the ith output bit. And this is actually a somewhat high locality predicate that can depend on b times bl number of input bits. All right. So, what we consider is that when the block locality is above 3, is equal to or above 3, a very nice property that is useful is the fact that when the degree of the bipartite graph is at least 3, there actually exist good expanders. And here the concrete notion of expansion we want is unique neighbor expansion, but I won't go into details. Can you just think that we have good expansions? And this will lead to the fact that we can have blockwise locality 3 small bias generator or PRG that resists all linear attacks. And furthermore, with suitable parameters, as you can imagine, such functions are actually high locality function with good expansion. And this type of uh, functions have been previously assumed by Appelbaum and the Rakoff to be one way and the pseudo random. Okay. And furthermore, we can also show some harness amplification result with respect to these blockwise local PRGs. I'm not going to go much more detailed than uh, on uh, what we have on blockwise local PRG. The biggest question you probably is asking is okay, so what about? Locality two, right? And it turns out that when you have when when the degree becomes two, we do not have graph with unique neighbor expansion anymore. And as a result, although we can show about the um, about the case where the block locality three disappear, except from some harness amplification result, and it turns out that actually. It just does not, it did not exist. Okay, so and the attacks are quite cool. And please tune in for the next talk for the concrete attacks. Okay. And as you can see, then there's a little star at the end. And what this star really says is that so far there is still a very tiny window of expansion that are not ruled out when you have suitable parameters. But this tiny window expansion is also not known to be sufficient for I.O. Okay. Uh, what is this window between 2 and 3? Well, this window is not between 2 and 3. The window is about the expansion. right? So it could be 1.5 or whatever. It's more, more nuanced than that. Yeah. Okay. So this is as much as I, uh, I will go into for blockwise locality. And the rest of the talk, I will instead focus on the construction of going from low degree multilinear map all the way to I.O. And in order to do that, we follow the common paradigm in a few recent works, is to go through the intermediate step of functional encryption. And different works
works differ in terms of what type of functional encryption we actually need. And it has been shown that by weakening the type of functional encryption we need, it achieves the effect of eventually weaken the algebraic structure we need. And the FE we need are those ones for computing degree D polynomials. And we will want them to have very good efficiency called linear efficiency. And I will just simply shorthand them as degree DFE. So step one is to go from degree DFE to IO. And this is the step where we throw in the block locality DPRG. And in this work, we give a degree preserving bootstrapping in the sense that we manage to make sure that the block locality equals to exactly the degree of the FE needed. And the key idea is what has appeared um, in the literature, which is the pre-processing idea. And in the second step, we're going to try to construct those low-degree functional encryption using low-degree multilinear map. And here again, we managed to obtain a degree-preserving functional encryption construction. And the key idea here is to somehow recursively compose a very simple type of functional encryption merely for computing in a product. So in the rest of the talk, I'm just I'm going to try to attempt to give you some high-level idea about both of the steps. And we'll start from the bootstrapping, okay? which is the part where the PRG come into play. So yeah? this uh, JQD FE, does it still not go through the normal FE before getting to I.O. or not? Yes, it will go through it. Yeah, exactly. So let me tell first briefly rec recall what are functional encryptions. So functional encryption are basically encryption with the augmented capability of giving out the partial decryption keys. Like an encryption, you can encrypt a message. And additionally, you can also generate the partial decryption key associated with a circuit. And when you decrypt the ciphertext using this partial decryption key, what you get is not the message itself, but the output of the message when being evaluated as the input for the circuit. So for security, clearly we would want the normal semantic security when no key is present at all. That means that ciphertext of two vectors of different messages should be computationally indistinguishable. And for functional encryption, we would additionally want that even when the attacker is given a secret key for a vector of different circuits, as long as these circuits do not separate these two vectors of messages in terms of outputs, then given those secret key should not help distinguishing the ciphertext. And that's the semantic security. Notice that semantic security hides only the message and does not provide any hiding property for the circuits at all. And one important parameter of functional encryption is how efficient the encryption algorithm works. And in the most relaxed form, encryption could depend polynomially on the security parameter, the message length, and even the circuit size that one tries to compute. And in this work, we we'll consider two additional notions, or has already been considered in the literature. One is called the compactness property, that naturally we will want encryption to be independent or only grow mildly with respect to the size of the circuit to be computed. And here compactness means the dependency on the circuit size is sublinear. Another efficiency, the more stringent the efficiency requirement, we call linear efficiency. Here encryption not only do not depend on the circuit size at all, but in fact also depend linearly on the length of the message. All right, so to not confuse you, we'll only look at compactness and linear efficiency. And linear efficiency will be associated with those degree DFE, and compactness will be associated with those FE for NC1. OK, so coming back to bootstrapping from low degree FE to IO. Yes? Yes, you can just look at it. Encryption time depends linearly on the message length and polynomially on the security parameter. So it's important about time. Like it's about time, yeah. I, I don't think it's that important. If you just uh, restrict the ciphertext size, it's fine too. The size, yeah. 
the size of the ciphertext. Yeah. Okay. So the bootstrapping work starts, as someone has already noticed, from the recent work where we can actually bootstrap from FE for the bigger class of NC1 all the way to IO. So therefore, what we essentially want is a kind of lifting up for functional encryption from this simple class of degree D polynomial computation all the way to the more complex NC1 computation. And a couple of results in the literature managed to achieve this, and they introduced kind of progressively new ideas in this step in order to minimize the degree of the functional encryption that we need to start with. And the first is that we can achieve the degree of the functional encryption needed to be three times the locality of the PRG plus one. Okay? And we'll look at the um, very soon. And next, we're two other work, including this work, is to reduce the degree all the way to the locality. And finally, in the new work, we'll further reduce the degree to the block locality. And this also served kind of progressively as a nice way of different steps to see fully how this bootstrapping is done. So we're going to start from the first step. And the idea is really simple. And as you would expect, if we want to, if we want to reduce a complex computation to a simple computation, what do you do? Well, we use randomized encoding. Well, additionally, we use local PRG to generate the randomness for computing these encodings. So randomized encoding allows us to represent a complex computation by a simple computation. And in this case, from NC1 to NC04, okay, by the classical AIK randomized encoding. And because the encoding is in NC04, means every output, every bit in the encoding can be computed with only locality 4. In other words, you can view this randomized encoding procedure as a degree four computation. And importantly, this fact will become useful later, is that it actually has degree one on the input bits and have degree three in the random bits. Okay. So if I want to construct FE for NC1, where the only thing I have is FE for very low degree computation. Well, the most natural thing is to instead try to compute randomized encoding. So we'll actually publish a ciphertext with the input and the randomness for encoding and produce a secret key which computes the randomized encoding. And because the randomized encoding has super small degree, it suffices to start with, in fact, just a degree four functional encryption. The more tricky part is the compactness requirement. Remember that eventually we want to get FE for NC1 that is compact. And what that says is I want the encryption time to be sublinear in the function size. So what is the encryption time here? Because the tool that we use, degree DFE, has very good efficiency, linear efficiency. The encryption time is linear in the input size, which is the length of the input and the R. And in order for it to be sublinear, there's a possible constraint on the randomized encoding we need. What we need are those randomized encoding that are randomness efficient. The length of the randomness should be sublinear in the size of the function it's trying to encode. It's not obvious why we have that, and in fact, we don't directly. In the rest of the talk, I'm going to start to ignore the polynomial factors. And this is where the PRG comes into play. Rachel, maybe for the PRG, um, is it because you just have indistinguishability security on the encryption? Is this like, you know, would this be secure? Because like, it's not like if x is uh, x and x prime are, you know, f of x equals f of x prime in the randomized encoding. Right, but we only have uh, we only want one key FE. I see. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean the degree D? The degree D is not a simulation secure one. That's true. It's not exactly 
if the actual function will be more complicated, you will have to use those Trojan style um, method to embed the randomized encoding. But let's just ignore it for this talk. I will not go into that uh, completely. Okay, so there's some other subtlety. It will increase the degree by one. But uh, okay. yeah, there's some other subtlety. All right, but let's ignore that. <laughs> so in order to have randomness efficiency, the most natural idea is to use some kind of pseudo-random object, either PRF or PRG. PRF is clearly too high degree of computation, so let's opt to for PRG. So we're going to use R, which is the output of the PRG on some seed, with the hope that now the actual randomness is just the seed itself could be much shorter. And therefore, ciphertext will encrypt X and the seed S. And correspondingly, we will publish the secret key for a function G, which will compute the composition of the PRG and the randomized encoding together, and evaluate the encoding using the output of the PRG. And with this, it indeed solved the compactness problem. Why? Because the length of the seed is sublinear in the length of the randomness. And without loss of generality, we can assume the latter to be linear in the size of the function. And that would lead us to input, which is sublinear in the size of the function, and hence the encryption time. However, we can do this, but we have to pay a price in terms of degree, because the function computed now here is the composition of the PRG and the randomized encoding. I recall that. The randomized encoding have degree 1 in the input bit and degree 3 in the random bit. Now this will translate into the degree, which is 3 times the degree of the PRG plus 1. And that's in particular upper bounded by 3 times the locality plus 1, because lo locality upper bounds the degree. Okay. So very simple ideas. And this give us the first bootstrapping. At least we can do it with Fe with reasonably small degree. Yeah? So, uh, this three times the first one, you're saying L has to be at least uh, 5 and, uh, and therefore uh, something, right? Yeah, L has to be at least 5, so. But you're saying small degree is good enough. You don't need small degree. Right, right. Okay. Small degree is enough, certainly. L is an upper bound, yeah. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is that we'll see how to use some new preprocessing idea to drive the degree from 3L plus 1 all the way to L, exactly the locality. So this is the step that's more involved. OK, so come back to preprocessing. What we want to do is that we want to evaluate this computation, which is G. The preprocessing idea, generically, is trying to seek to decompose this computation into two functions, A and B, so that we can publish the output of A, which is a part of the computation of G, already do so in encryption time and encrypt the output. So that then we just need to give out a key for function B, which is potentially much lower degree. And that's kind of the whole idea. Preprocessing meaning that do part of the computation of G already at encryption time to reduce the degree of the computation one needs to do at decryption time. Subject to two constraints, one is compactness, means that the output of this A that produced the message to be encrypted should be sublinear in the function size. And the other is the degree. We want the degree of B to be very low. So to see whether this is possible, let's start with a very trivial idea. But well, we know that randomized encoding is degree 1 in input x and the degree 3 in randomness. Meaning that the function g can be written as a huge sum of all those monomials that have this form. And let's first think about how can I kind of preprocess away this multiplication with the input bit x. And the most idea, trivial idea is I have to do this multiplication with x at some time, and let's try to do it as encryption time. So we we'll encrypt additionally the tensor product of x and the seed s. And correspondingly, the key that we publish will need to be for function b. The first of all should compute the correct output of g given the tensor product of x and s. 
And additionally, the degree should be no one degree lower than the degree of g. Because we no longer need to do multiplication with x. Does it make sense? Okay, so whenever you have to compute a monomial that has starts with some xi, replace this xi with an appropriate element in the tensor product, and that will make the degree one less. So is this still compact? Well, let's look at the output of the function a. Is that the key thing is that here we have this tensor product. However, because the input is always going to be polynomial in the security parameter, it only increases the length of the seat or increases the input length by a polynomial factor. And therefore, the whole thing is still sublinear in the function size. So function, the compactness is good. Okay. So hopefully now you see that it is possible to preprocess away some of the computation. However, clearly, multiplication with x is only degree 1. What we really care about is to preprocess away the multiplication between different seed elements. So you can try to play with the same idea and to say that, well, let's just reduce degree by 1 first by pre-computing S tensor S. And that would allow us to reduce degree by 1 indeed. However, compactness become a problem. Why? Because the length of S tensor S is going to be sublinear multiplied twice, not sublinear anymore. Therefore, this idea totally does not work. And it also shows you that why I cannot just pre-compute everything and encrypt everything, because we are totally lose compactness. Ah, because then you will have to assume, if you can assume much stronger PRG, it's possible. Uh, how much stronger is the financial situation? What is the Well, for example, 1 minus epsilon, you can essentially think about, say if the PRG is expands by 1.5 in the exponent, okay. then this could be like a square root of f. Uh -huh. You can multiply and then still potentially. Right. It's, an, it's not worth it to try to assume high uh, expansion PRGs. All right, so how can we do this? In fact, there seems to be some very fundamental barrier um, when we try to preprocess multiplication between PRG outputs. If you think about it, there are all outputs of this like uh, local PRG, that they different output bits depend on different sets of seed inputs, seed elements. And since we're not making any assumption about the PRG, you might more assume that they are all random set of edges. Okay? So each output bit depends on a random set of seed elements. It would be very, very convenient for us to just think about the simple case where the output of uh, each output bit just multiplies the set of seed elements it depends on. Okay? It's not true, but it's really convenient to assume. Okay? And anyways, if, if it's not the case, just think about them as a sum of such elements, and you can do it. With this view, multiplying three different PRG outputs is basically multiplying 15 random seed elements all together. Right? And multiplication between different random elements, between different random edges, it's really hard to pre-process, pre-compute without expanding hugely. Okay? And that's something that we don't know how to do. So the idea is like to think about it reversely. Okay, fine, now what can we pre-compute? Well, what seems like we can pre-compute is if we multiply PRG output that depends on the same set of random seed elements, but on different seeds. Okay? Then you look at the product. They're basically product of different seed elements with the same random indices. 
multiplication between the same random edge can be pre-computed compactly. How? I just pre-compute the product within each column. And with those pre-computed products, we can compute the whole product with just degree which equals to the locality of the PRG. I'm not going there yet, yeah, but eventually. Not exactly. Okay, so that's roughly the idea. And let's remember this picture. We can pre-compute multiplication within the same random match. Okay? And the idea is, okay, fine, if this is what we can pre-compute, let's just massage this function g we need to compute into this form. How? We have to go back to the beginning. The NC1 function f that we're attempting to compute must consist of a bunch of Boolean circuits computing each output bit. And let's call them fi's. Without loss of generator, I'm going to assume each fi actually has a fixed polynomial size. And uh, because otherwise, I can simply pre compute, transform it first using computing Yau's garble circuit so that each fi becomes computing one garble gate. And therefore, we have fixed the size. For such a function, and the number of such function will be roughly the size of the function. For such a function f, computing its randomized encoding is computing the randomized encoding for each small function fi using independent randomness ri. And because the size of each fi is bounded, the size or the length of each random tape ri is also bounded. And in particular, multiplication only occurs within each ri instead of across. So we only care about computing the degree three monomials that look like rij, rik, ril. So far, we have been generating randomness in a rather generic way. We take a seed of the PRG, expand it to its output, and we chunk it into, chop it into chunks. Each chunk is ri. And even though that multiplication is only within each of the chunk, multiplication happens somewhat locally. Because the way that PRG operates, that multiplying three elements within each chunk is the same. It involves multiplying between lots of random edges that we don't know how to do, or we don't know how to pre-compute. So the idea is that why don't we just rotate all those random tapes ri? And we're going to generate the jth bit in each of the random tip using an independently chosen seed. Okay, so the jth bit in r1j, rij up to rmj will be expanded using seed sj. Similarly for the kth bit for the lth bit. Now you have a polynomial number of seed because each random tape has length polynomial. Now, here's the magic. Since multiplication happens within each ri, now the corresponding to multiplication between PRG outputs with the same random edges to different seeds. And this we know how to pre-compute. Namely, we're going to pre-compute all the degree 3 monomials over each column in all the different seeds. And from them, all the multiplication happening within each ri can be computed using just the locality of PRG. And we have to double check that the compactness is not uh, destroyed in the sense that the number of monomials that we need to pre-compute is still sublinear in the function size. And this is the case because the size of each column is actually quite small. It's only polynomial. Therefore, even if you blow it up by cubic, it's still polynomial. And therefore, we have compactness. And this allows us to start with the Fe, whose degree is exactly the locality of the PRG. And let's see now that how we can handle blockwise locality. 
It is actually just follows simply by extending the preprocessing idea we have already seen. Yeah? So, uh, I think before it worked with uh, locality and degree, and now this trick only works with locality. Mean, it only uh, works for locality, yeah. this picture, what we want is to compute three things inside each random tip that now will depend on different seeds, but instead of bits in those different seeds, input blocks in different seeds. So what we need to pre-compute now is multiplication within the blocks in each column. But that turns out to be also quite easy to do. First of all, we need to pre-compute all the monomials, no matter degree, within each of the block. Because the predicate of the PRG may compute high degree functions within the block. But because we restrict the block length, exactly here, to be logarithmic, computing all monomials will end up to be polynomial. And then we'll compute on top of those pre-computed monomials, degree three monomials. And then again, blow up the number of monomials by an exponent three, and that's still polynomial. And therefore, we can get do with Fe that have exactly the block locality as the, uh, with degree that's exactly the block locality of the PRG. Okay. I think uh, you showed right four is impossible or two is impossible. Three is possible. Okay. All right. So, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes. I don't think I can do the the whole thing uh, for the next for the next uh, chunk. Um, okay, so maybe let me just give the highest overview. Okay, so given that we have the bootstrapping, the next goal is to construct those low degree functional encryption using multilinear maps. And we want to use it the exact same degree multilinear map. So the bird's eye view. Well, let's think about how, how you would try to construct such a thing. We want to compute degree D polynomials. So let's, as a starter, a warm up to just think about computing monomials of degree D. Okay, I want to, given x1 to xd, I want to compute their product. But I want to compute their product without revealing the input. So the most naive idea is to say, well, we have the degree D multilinear map that exactly matches the degree. So let's just encode the different input elements inside the multilinear map. And it, that in particular would allow us to do pairing and in the end obtain an encoding of the product in the target group. And from there you can test whether the product is zero or not. So this clearly achieved functionality, at least to some extent, but the security is a big problem because multilinear map there's no necessary guarantee hiding of the input. In particular, you could test whether x1, x2, uh, any of the input element is zero or not. And also, if you want to rely on only weak security assumption of the multilinear map, then it is even worse. Because if you recall, the SXDH assumption only gives you a certain security guarantee when the encoding, when the elements being encoded are somewhat random or completely random. So this does not hide the input at all. So one way to achieve security, or to hide the input, as used in previous work, is to kind of throw in a different cryptographic primitive that will guarantee security. For example, randomized encoding. So idea in our previous work with Vinod is that instead of trying to give you encoding of the input directly, 
what if what you get, uh, what is given out is just an encoding of the randomized encoding itself of this computation of computing the monomial? Well, if you obtain an encoding of the randomized encoding, you can still use the pairing of multilinear map to compute, evaluate this randomized encoding, and therefore obtain the output. And additionally, security becomes trivial because it just follows from the randomized encoding hiding property that it hides the input. The less trivial part is how do you reach the point where the randomized encoding is contained, is, is produced. And the idea there is to actually use what we call an inner product encryption, which is a functional encryption for computing the inner product between two vectors. And uh, it can be constructed from just bilinear maps and the SXDH assumption. An idea in that paper is to use inner product encryption to separately encode the different ring, uh, encode the different input elements, so that in one by computing the inner product, it happened to produce the randomized encoding. Okay. So this is a very clean and kind of modular approach to achieve security. The problem is that it has some waste. In particular, evaluation of the randomized encoding will take at least degree D. And additionally, in order to compute this randomized encoding using inner product encryption, you will need additional degree of two. So end up that it will require degree 2D multilinear map. So even though it sounds like it's just a slight shading of a factor of 2, when we go down to asking for exact degree preserving construction, I just to completely change the construction. Because you really cannot rely on any additional cryptographic primitive in order to help with security. And rather, we have to achieve security from scratch. And the basic idea here is that, well, the first idea, the first, the very first naive idea is still valid. Because if you cannot waste the degree at all, every degree has to be spent on computing some multiplication between the inputs. It's just that the encoding using multilinear map directly is not a good encoding. And instead, you really should, we can, is to encode the elements using inner product encryption directly. And then recursively, each layer of inner product encryption is going to produce the cipher text for the next layer to operate upon. And when you do that, because inner product encryption provides a much stronger hiding property, it will eventually guarantee the input is hidden. And the advantage is that there is no waste of the degree at all. So, um, the actual construction is uh, very, very complicated. And uh, I thought that it might be possible to give you an idea about the quadratic FE, just, just to go to degree two using bilinear maps. However, I don't think I have any time left. So I just leave it as is. You can ask me offline how this is done. And just fast forward all the way to the end. Okay. So what we now have is that we can construct IO from degree 5 multilinear map with a locality 5 PRG or from trilinear map with block locality 3 PRG. And so far, we're still barred away from bilinear map that we do have. Our word is that the interesting fork point, either that we can go beyond bilinear to trilinear map and therefore everything is wonderful, or we're living in a world where this barrier is fundamental and we cannot cross. Okay, I think finding it out is, is very interesting. All right, thank you. I'm the I'm a positive person. I want to conjecture we we live in the world that we can do everything. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> That's the first thing one should try to do. Why not? <laughs> I don't want to go too much into it. Uh, I just want to say, you know, this is uh, this is the oldest 